Literary Slummers to another episode of Hate Read. I'm Anna. And I'm Em. Every fortnight here on Hate Read, one of us challenges the other to read a book that we think they'll hate, and then we talk about it. Uh, this fortnight, neither of us offered the challenge. Instead, we were challenged by special guest Santa Claus. Uh, betrayed by Santa. Betrayed by Santa to read... The Christmas Shoes by Donna Van Leer. Um, So first things first, I guess to both of us, uh, you can go first and then I'll go as well. Did we finish this book? I did. I would never let down Santa. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So what'd you think? It was bad. It was so bad. It was so bad, you guys. It was so bad. So I already have, like, a very strong hatred for the song, (laughs) Christmas Shoes. And it is a hatred that has burned in my heart for at least ten years. Mm -hmm. Um, (laughs) Because I think that's how long the song has been around. Uh, 2000, yeah, 2001, yeah, I think 2001 is when it came out. So Oh, it came out in 2001? Okay, well, then it's been a little bit longer than ten years, but... um, or it might have been 2000. It's, I'm not sure It's which. my least favorite Christmas song. I have to change the radio station when it comes on the radio station. I have, like, thumbs down every iteration of the song. That song that pops up on my Google Play Christmas holiday radio station. Like, it just haunts me. Um, and I was flabbergasted when I found out there was a movie of mm-hmm, this mm-hmm. song starring Rob Lowe. Uh-huh. Um, and I refused to watch it. And then, much to my surprise, Santa revealed... There is also a novelization of this song. Yeah. Well, which, okay. Did why? you look into kind of the the history behind this song at all? Because it's kind of wild. No, I didn't because I really didn't want to know more about it than I had to. Enlighten, please. Uh, okay, so The Christmas Shoes is a song by the Christian vocal group New Song, which that's a name, I guess. <laughs> and But they based it on a I guess short story short essay that was in like chicken soup for the Christian soul called like gold shoes for Jesus or something like that which is purportedly a true story so Mm -hmm. supposedly this is a true thing that happened in the like in the 70s or 80s happened to this woman Mm -hmm. named uh, let me look it up real quick. I think it's Heidi something. Oh my god, chicken soup for the soul books. That is like, that's like a trip. I forgot those existed. So this was this was uh yeah originally from Chicken Soup for the Christian Soul was the book this originally appeared in, and it was by a woman named Helga Schmidt, but submitted by someone else. So like, there's already layers going on here, and I'm not gonna read the whole thing mm-hmm. right now because. A, I don't want to get sued, and B, it, it, I mean, it's not a long story. If you guys look up Golden Shoes for Jesus, you should be able to find it and read it yourself. But essentially, it's, you know, the the story that we know in the song, except that I presume it's mm-hmm. a woman who is experiencing this since it's in first person. And it is just, like, like it is filled with, like, poverty porn. Like, the, there's two kids mm. in this version. There's a boy and a, a boy of about five and a slightly younger girl. And they've got a ragged coat. They've got enormously large tattered tennis shoes. His much too short jeans. He crumpled, he clutched several crumpled dollar bills in his grimy hands. And then the girl is described Ew. as clothing resembling her brother's. Her head was a matted mess of curly hair. Reminders of an evening meal showed on her small face. Um, so they're buying a pair of golden house slippers and they go up and they're short three bucks. And the boy says like, oh, we'll come back tomorrow. And the girl just starts crying and says, but Jesus would have loved these shoes. So the, the (laughs) woman who oversees this quickly hands the clerk $3 because it it was Christmas and they'd waited for a long time. And they, they say, oh, Mm -hmm, thank mm -hmm. you. And she says, what did you mean when you said Jesus would like the shoes? And the boy answered, our mommy is sick and going to heaven. Daddy said she might go before Christmas to be with Jesus. And the girl spoke, my Sunday school teacher said the streets up in heaven are shiny gold, just like these shoes. Won't my mommy be beautiful walking on those streets to match these shoes? 
My eyes flooded as I looked into her tear-streaked face. Yes, I answered. I'm sure she will. And then it ends with, Silently, I thanked God for using these children to remind me of the true spirit of giving. So, like, this is already a gross story, like, from the go. But then we have this, like, weird history yeah. of this is supposedly, like, a true thing that happened. But, you know, it's 100% not. This never happened. This is nonsense. <laughs> <laughs> this is, this and is that this... woman's name was Albert Einstein. Right. Like, it's like those email chains <laughs> that your grandmother passed around in the, like, late 90s. Like, it, it's, it didn't happen. It, Grandma, we need to talk. This, no, nobody got up and clapped at the end, you know? Like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, it was this true story that was in Chicken Soup. And then the mm -hmm. song, the, the band found it and liked it. And started writing their song, but it wasn't, like, going to be on a Christmas album. It was just on a regular album as, like, a bonus track. And then their friend, who is the author of this book, started writing this book. And at the same time-ish, they started oh producing gosh. the movie. So this was, like, kind of all happening concurrently. So the, the song came out in 2001, and the book and movie both came out in 2002. Um, the movie, from what I've found, is slightly less religious ish like it's still religious but it's not quite as like aggressively so as this book was um mm -hmm. which i mean is fine if that's what you're reading this book for but the reason i bring it up is because the band like later came out and said like oh they didn't really like the fact that they toned like they they said it they weren't like angry about it but they said it like politely but they were they didn't like the fact that it didn't like talk about jesus every five seconds um, because that's really what they were going huh. for with wait, the song. The way they they wrote the song, but didn't like that it. They didn't like the, the movie. way it was written. They didn't like the movie. Oh, they didn't like the movie. Yeah, okay, sorry, sorry, I, sorry, I, I should have clarified. There's three three plus versions of this fucking story going around. So <laughs> anyway, that's the the story behind the story. Uh, and and I mean, you just have to kind of this kind of story. Like I understand, like yes, there is this bigger message of what the true meaning of Christmas is and how we shouldn't, like, just have this overly commercialized holiday and we should think about people who are less fortunate than us and help our fellow man and blah, 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 blah. But the way that they come off in the song and I guess oh, it's the book terrible. And, or, and I guess the movie and the book is, like, of look at this wonderful thing I did. Right. And that just really rubs me the wrong way. And also, like... <laughs> Like, it's more of, like, to show off how great you yes. were. How, how great of a Christian you were. How great of a, just a person in general you were by doing this small favor of $3. And it also, like, gets into the whole, like, philosophical debate, which is, like, way too heavy for a comedy podcast. So this is probably going to get cut. But, you know, like, the whole <laughs> question of evil thing, right? Like, why does God let bad things happen if, you know, there is a God? Um, why do bad things exist? And there are a mm -hmm. lot of philosophers who have come up with a lot of answers to this. But the answer that this song and book and presumably movie seems to espouse is God lets bad things happen to people so that wealthier people <laughs> can realize how <laughs> great God is. Like, how good they're... Yeah, like to get back uh, on the straight and narrow. It's so gross. Which, it's so gross. Yeah, yeah. It's not a good way to deliver the message at all. <laughs> and getting mm -hmm. away from just the story, which is garbage, the writing is not good, man. It's not good. I this is this book. It I think including the twenty five percent of the book that is a that uh, preview for her next novel yeah. um, is all together one hundred and forty four pages mm -hmm. long. So maybe like 110 pages of book. And I still was like skimming because I was like, this is too long. This, it was, it <laughs> was not. I mean, the fact that the plot can be like, the, the, it does not add really anything to the plot of the song. So it's like, if you no. can already summarize it in a song, like how you need to add something in order to, blow a story out of it you know it's like Rudolph the Red mm -hmm. Nose well I don't know if that's a good example okay uh I'm trying to think of like so other movies that are Christmas songs um okay so like uh, uh the grandma got run over by a reindeer animated movie which I loved as a child because <laughs> my grandmother hated it um 
But <laughs> that movie. What a good granddaughter. <laughs> Not because I don't like my grandma. It was just like a thing that we always wanted to watch at her house because she got annoyed at yeah, us. Yeah, yeah. Um, but that movie <laughs> is like, it takes the, the you know, s- admittedly very stupid song, Christmas song, Grandma Got Run Over by a Reindeer, uh-huh. and adds plot points to it in order to make it an appropriate length for an animated film, which is to say still not that long. Right, right. And they, they don't really do that here. Like you get backstory, but the action of the story is the exact same as the fucking song (laughs) yes it's so and then and then there's just this whole added like unnecessary addition of the man who gives the little boy money and his whole Mm. backstory and how we're supposed to sympathize with this poor individual and then just that's always been i'm over it that's the song too that's the song in this original story too like it's from the perspective of the person giving the money it's not from the perspective of the kid Mm -hmm. and that's kind of what the issue is it's like stop using disability and illness and poverty as a way to prop yourself up you know like it's like Yes, these are stories that should be told. We should be telling stories of people with cancer. We should be telling stories of people who have, like, well, who are on the, you know, like, below the poverty line. Um, Yeah, low socioeconomic status. We should not be telling those stories from the outside perspective of the man who ran into the boy at a store one time and gave him some money. Like, that's not, that's nothing. That's nothing. You've, you've given us nothing. (laughs) <laughs> it was awful. It was awful. It was honestly infuriating. It was bad. Like, and also, can I just say, I know it I'm kind of like... It not want to celebrate Christmas. Right? <laughs> Here was the other thing I was going to say. This is not a book. I'm ranting so much, and I'm not even, like, being funny right now. I'm just legitimately being mad at this book. Um, this was a book that, like, <laughs> I personally, as someone who's had issues with depression and, you know, boring shit like that for a long time, this was a fucking bummer of a book. Like, this really... Oh, yeah. Was... It wasn't, like sad in a like up like I know we trashed Nicholas Sparks but this wasn't sad in a Nicholas Sparks way where I felt like this was not a Nicholas Sparks this was not a Nicholas Sparks book but it wasn't like that type of sadness where I'm like okay I get what you're doing it was literally just like sadness for sadness's sake and it was so yes like I felt so bummed out after reading this fucking book it was just more of that tragedy porn yeah that I hate so much. It was straight up tragedy <laughs> porn. There were tragedy wing wangs Ugh. all over. All over. It was just, <laughs> It was like this book was trying to have the biggest tragedy mm-hmm. wing, wing wang of them all. And yeah. It was too much. Um, though there was a part at the end where, similar to um, Message in a Bottle, I did LOL when someone died at the end. Because it was just like, <laughs> what, why? Why did this happen? It was unnecessary. Which I guess... Kind of, so. <laughs> uh, well, I think I know which one you're talking about, and it was very necessary because we can't have female characters with like agency of their own. They they have to be dead. That is true. <laughs> That's the she rule. had to learn her lesson. All right, we got to talk about like the actual. I mean, you guys know, you guys know, you've heard the fucking song, you know how this story goes, but we have to talk about it. Yeah. Yep. So, first off, let me tell you the way this book is set up. Terribly. There is the book opens with a preface, and I don't know if I've ranted about this on the show before, but I hate Probably. when a book starts with a preface or a prologue or a foreword that basically adds nothing to the story that we couldn't have gotten mm-hmm. in regular exposition mm-hmm. and world building in the actual story. This book, hooray, has a preface and a prologue <laughs> to set up this weird frame story, and I don't understand. Okay, the preface, I don't know. I don't know what was going day. on with the per- point of view in this. What the fuck was it? There was no... I was so confused. Oh my God. <gasps> so bad. All right, we got to we got focus on I'm sorry. I'm sorry. So, no, you're good. The, the preface of the book is current day, an unnamed narrator, who we assume is the first person narrator throughout the rest of the book, but, you know. Maybe. Um, is talking about the real meaning of Christmas or some shit and is like, let me spin you a yarn. That's the preface. The prologue is a flashback to the year 2000, where the main character is visiting a cemetery, and there's, like, some cuts of other characters that pop in or whatever. Not not important. So, <laughs> we've got current day, we've got the year 2000, and then chapter one starts, 
is a flashback to 1985 and the beginning of the actual story. Right. Why are there so many layers to this? Why right. couldn't, like, in the year 2000, while he's visiting the cemetery, talked about all the Christmas beliefs that he talked about in the preface? Why does it have to be two separate things? Because it's not like, during the rest of the story, he shies away from just going on long, rambling asides about his thoughts and feelings and emotions that have nothing to do with anything like that's most of this book is his is him just being like i'm gonna think some things and then weirdly it kept it kept they were like there it was a first person narrator through some of the book but it was also in third person but it was also maybe still in first person but just like i don't know i don't know if it was just like first person and he's it was omniscient very bizarre was he omniscient because there was a part where he was like visiting his mother and he left and then it continued to be in first person but described stuff that she did after he left and he had no way of knowing that <laughs> you know what edgy joke time um he was a um upper middle class white male he probably did think he was omniscient i think that's and 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 edgy i think probably this is all in first person and it's just him like making up the other stuff he's like "Mm -hmm." Mm -hmm. yeah and then this that must have been what they thought that's that's what they thought and then this woman was probably dying of cancer and so she probably had I bet she had two children. Like, he's making this all up in his head. Yes. And they were poor, so they were dirty children. They were dirty, gross babies. Which, like, at no point in the story is it implied that, like, these people don't care for their... Like, uh, it's so stupid. There was no reason for this child to have been dirty when he appeared at the mall because he was very well looked (laughs) after by his parents. So... He got into some So, we have our main character. He got into a honeypot on his way to the mall. (laughs) <laughs> he got all sticky. And then he smeared dirt on his Just face for no reason. Just sticky baby. Must have been a poor people game. I didn't understand. <laughs> so, we have our main character, Robert, who is a lawyer. A garbage person. Um, he's a partner at his law firm. And he, yes, he is a grade A garbage person. He's obsessed with his work to the point where he's neglecting his family, but thinks he's making up for it by buying them nice things. Mm. He is married to Kate who wants a divorce because this guy is a garbage man and he has two kids. I guess they have no problem with him. I don't know. Then it was well, never really explained. They don't have a problem with him in the sense of like, we hear from them that they have a problem, but everybody else is like, your children don't even know you, Robert. And it's like, I, yeah, yes. they seem fine <laughs> with the situation. But then again, like also, they he, didn't. Yeah. never talks to them so i guess we don't really know <laughs> yeah they maybe have like two lines in the whole book and maybe that many appearances i don't know it was dumb um also so we have the 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 first person perspective points are from robert's point of view and then we have the second story that's happening concurrently and has almost nothing to do with robert's story except for that one pivotal moment that the song is about nathan who's a second grader his mother maggie is dying of ovarian cancer um, and he has a dad named Jack who is a car mechanic, which is only relevant because of one scene that is irrelevant. And <laughs> I totally um, forgot about that scene Rachel. until this moment. <laughs> yeah, it's because it doesn't belong in the book at all. <laughs> like most so, of the book. <laughs> so to add, so we we introduced to both of these families. You forgot the the super important C plot though. Oh, with the the second grade teacher <laughs> the who teacher uh, is very overly randomly involved in inserting life. herself into this child's life. Yeah. Well, I guess like she was like, "Well, my mother died of cancer when I was young, so I'm going to assume this is how Nathan wants to cope with his mother dying of cancer and not ask him." Which is literally for him. she's only Which... in the book in order to have the moment where she's like my favorite Christmas memory was getting some shoes for Christmas and they made me feel pretty mm. and special. And then Nathan's like, oh, idea. Christmas I'm going to go get shoes? my dead cancer mom some shoes. <laughs> <laughs> Which, okay, well, we'll get to that when we get to that. <laughs> um, so to add another unnecessary layer to the story, we now have a flashback to when Maggie found out she had cancer right oh after having God. her second child, Rachel. Um, they don't have a lot of money to pay for their hospital bills. And so she's at the hospital and she's talking about it. And somehow a receptionist is just allowed to yell across the entire hospital for everyone to hear that Maggie doesn't have money to pay for her hospital bills. It was the 80s. It was a different time. <laughs> it was a wild west of, 
patient confidentiality. HIPAA didn't exist in the 80s. <laughs> I don't know if it did or not, honestly. <laughs> so we were reminded that Maggie is poor. Um, she runs into Kate at the hospital, who is the wife of Robert, the lawyer, and the two start up a conversation. And because Maggie is at the hospital with her daughter, Rachel, Kate offers to watch Rachel while Maggie gets her test results. Um, Rachel is somehow, like, convinced by total strangers to leave her child with a total stranger mm-hmm. um, to get her test results. Because, because she does, this she finds book out she has. makes the point multiple times of saying that leaving your children with total strangers is just, like, terrible and she would never do it. She would... She refused to keep working when she got pregnant because she didn't want to leave her children with total mm. strangers. Oh God, Anyone who would leave their child with a total stranger, like a daycare worker, is obviously a momster, which is a mom monster. Yep. Uh, you're just you're just trash. <laughs> you're trash if you do that. They don't deserve to have children. You don't deserve it. Basically. Stay home with your children, which, women. You know, you can sacrifice everything in order to stay home for your kids, and you should. And if you don't, just God help you. It's just, I, th- that made me so mad. There's a whole viewpoint. Uh, anyway, there were a lot of like. Yeah. The divorce stuff. Of, the divorce stuff. What is stuff? the word I'm looking for? Oh my God. Yeah, there was, there was definitely an agenda to this book. Secret agenda that wasn't very secret. Um, <laughs> so Maggie finds out she has cancer and she retrieves her daughter from Kate. And Kate's like, hey, let's go get coffee um, and be friends. But Maggie's too distraught about test results and blows off Kate. So this meeting, this meeting between the two of them is not relevant to the rest of the story. not at all. It's just kind of like a weird coincidence. Look how the stories mesh together, except not. (sighs) So that's sad. (laughs) Robert and Kate... Then go on to Christmas decorating lunch at Robert's mother's house. So we fast fast forward back to the. Oh yeah, we're back in present. Well, back we're in back pre- in the first level of day. flashback, the first inception layer. <laughs> um, Robert's mother tells Robert he has to change in order to save his marriage because she is just sure, hundred percent positive that Kate still loves Robert even though he has neglected her for like the past decade probably, and she would definitely be willing to take. Robert back if he just changed a little bit and you know women just they just want a tiny bit of, a, of attention and affection and that's enough to keep them going for years mm-hmm. essentially mm-hmm. is her point also her other point that she makes is that um the reason that divorce rates are so high now in the 80s is because um people are lazy and they don't want to work at their oh marriages God. it's not because of like women's increased economic uh, prospects making it possible for them to leave their husband um, because they aren't essentially Mm -hmm. tied to their husband for life in a form of, one might call it, you know, like indentured servitude uh, because they have (laughs) very few job prospects and can't provide for themselves and their children if they divorce their husband and oftentimes wouldn't even be able Mm. to divorce their husband. It's definitely just because they're lazy. Like that was, that's definitely, that's definitely what it is. Yep. 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 (sighs) It's this, the whole book is just so frustrating. Like going back and thinking about it and then like, I'm still discovering things to be mad about. Yeah. (laughs) It was like like 110 pages long. (laughs) It was not a long book to be this mad about. (laughs) <laughs> so Robert though doesn't believe anything his mom says and he's like nah ma our marriage is over don't know what to tell you our marriage okay. is trash now mommy <laughs> I don't want to work on it and she doesn't want to work on it so we're not going to work on it uh, it's very unproductive conversation <laughs> we are then attacked by scene, some scenes of Robert being a dick and Maggie's life being super fucking sad um, including one scene in which Robert takes his car to Jack's auto shop and then yells at him about the cost of the repairs. Again, this interaction between the two families is not relevant at all to us. Also, of the story. doesn't ever get resolved. Like, I thought that was gonna. No. Here, here were my two predictions for this book. Number one, with this scene, I thought that at some point everything would come together and he would realize that this is the guy he yelled at and he would like, I don't know, apologize or set up a college fund for his kids or some shit. I don't know literally anything 
<laughs> instead yeah. of just like this being he never he never learned from it he never like realized hey i should have been nice to that guy it's literally nothing that was my yeah. first thought my second thought was that he was actually dead the whole time and was a ghost and was like oh let me tell you and that's why he oh. knew all this stuff but that didn't happen either and i just really wanted him to be dead <sighs> partly because it would have made sense and also because i wanted him to die yeah yeah i think it would have been better if he met jesus instead of maggie yeah that would have been good too if he was like man i've really learned something from these christmas shoes let me give you my ovaries yeah yeah and he's like take me instead take me (laughs) and they were like okay (laughs) that's how god works guys Uh, in mysterious ways so then this this is a huge thing for me so in one of the scenes of Maggie's life being super fucking sad and shit, they, she tries to explain to Nathan that one, she is dying because they haven't told him yet. I think they finally tell him like two days before she dies that she's going yeah. to die, which, which dick I can, move. I mean, I can understand not wanting to tell your kid because it's like, how do, how do you do, do that? that? But also you, you do have to do that. <laughs> yeah you should allow them some time to adjust to it like he thought nathan thought like oh my mom's sick but she's gonna get better because sick people get better right uh not always and so we have to sit through this excruciating scene of maggie explaining to her son that she's not gonna get better but then also like when people say oh it was such a pity that god took her so young to not feel that like God didn't take me, he received me. And so, like, trying to just frame it so that Nathan feels better about the loss of his mom. Oh, no, we're not supposed to say loss of his mom. To the, I don't know, absence of his mother in his life her, now. His mother's um, joyful skipping away from her children into the arms of a loving and benevolent deity. Yes, yes. <laughs> and it's just so, like, oh, it was so hard to read because it was, one, very very emotionally charged and sad and to just like infuriating because she's doing this as she is like about to like be actively dead dying after this scene like... yes like they know they're like okay i've got like 24 hours left i better tell my son i'm about to die <laughs> so what, what do you think the time uh, the timeline should be for telling your kid that you're gonna die if you're about to bite the b- bullet like i mean like Surely, as someone who has not had terminal cancer, I feel like, isn't there a moment when you are told, like, this is terminal, you should prepare and get your affairs in order? Like, that would be the point, I think, that I would sit down with my kids and explain to them, which is hopefully at least, like, a month or two. I, again, have no experience with this, fortunately, but I would imagine. You don't think it should be, like immediately before a really widely celebrated holiday um that's probably gonna ruin that holiday forever for them like because i think that would probably be ideal i think like if you could wait before yeah, like you would want to make July, it as traumatic as possible yeah you get it depends when you get the diagnosis mm-hmm. right because if you get it like in mm-hmm. you know October, you got plenty of options. You know, you could go Halloween, which, you know, that ties right in, right? You could go, you could, you could wait for any number. That was really terrible. I'm so sorry. You could wait for any number of, you know, winter winter celebrations depending on your faith or if you just want to go non-denominational you can just go for the big one go for new year's so that they associate the passage of time Mm. with the passage of their own mother um that'd be good you but then Mm. like if you're unlucky and you get your diagnosis in like march like what do you you gotta wait till like fourth of july or something mother's day man mother's day you gotta wait till mother's day i mean that's gonna be ruined anyway (laughs) That is true. Well, I guess also, like, if you have any birthdays or anniversaries coming up, those could also. So, I mean, really. Mm, mm. Their birthday would be the idea. Yes. And if you, like. That's how I'll You have, like, a surprise party. Um, You pop out behind the couch. There's, Uh like, streamers, balloons. They're like, oh, my gosh. And you're like, guess what? I'm dying. It's terminal. (laughs) This is getting really dark. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but oh, a very long dark, story short it's kind bit. of a dick move yeah <laughs> <laughs> so 
we leave we leave the sad sack family behind and we go back to first person robert who notices it's 11 p.m on christmas eve and he hasn't gone christmas shopping yet because he is garbage <laughs> Um, so he goes to some, whatever department store is still open at 11 PM on Christmas Eve, which that was kind of wild. I, I guess like that would be the equivalent of going to like, oh, having a Walmart open 24 seven. But yeah, I guess. But I felt, I feel like um, things close. Like, I feel like that's a fairly modern thing of inconveniencing retail workers, you know, like that's. I guess it was the 80s. Yeah. I don't know. We kind of shat on retail workers then, too, I guess. I don't know. If you were alive in 1985 and had to go Christmas shopping on Christmas Eve, yeah, let us know Eve, what the hours were. Hit at us. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, he goes to this department store, and he runs into Nathan, who, guess what? He's shopping for shoes. And he goes to the register, and the guy's like, ah, oh, man, I can't believe I had to be online buying this stupid kid. And the cashier's like, oh, the shoes are 14 bucks. And Nathan's like, I only got four bucks. And then he just turns around to Robert and's like, buy these shoes for me, for my mama, please. It's Christmas Eve, and these shoes are just her size. Um, and <laughs> Could you hurry, sir? Daddy Robert says there's said, not much time. <laughs> not, there's not much time. She's been sick for quite a while. I think these shoes will make her smile. <laughs> this song. Because mama beats Jesus <laughs> no. tonight. And then the chorus of little tiny children comes out, and they all do the chorus once a cappella. <laughs> you guys know. You've heard all, this song. They're all, like, they're all just so dirty they're and so poor, dirty and, and poor. they all come out from, like, they're hiding in the clothes racks. And they just <laughs> their all, own like, shoes are, like, oh, like doing that thing they do in, in uh, cartoons where the top part has, like, flipped up. Yes. <laughs> Exposing their socks that have a hole their, in the big their toe. Little, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so yes yeah, so he just turns around to robert and is like hey man can you help me buy these shoes and robert suddenly his whole life changes and he says yes i'll buy these shoes for you and i'm also from now on going to be a good dad and human because shoes <laughs> so he 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 puts away all of the christmas shopping that he did and he rushes home to his wife and <laughs> And he goes, I didn't get anyone anything for Christmas because I knew the best gift would be me. Which, no. <laughs> Which, no. Like, no. No. And, like, he meant his presence in their life, but that's not what he said. <laughs> I just, can you imagine if you were divorcing your husband and you're like, mm -hmm. I, you work 16 hours a day. Um, you don't appreciate me. You don't like show me that you love me in any sort of way. Like you're never around. Um, and he comes back to the house. Oh, and you're like, also, I think you're cheating on me with someone, but I can't say for sure. Mm -hmm. Um, and he comes back to the house past midnight after having been at the office. Um, and is like, Hey, I didn't get you shit for Christmas, but at least I'm here though. It's like you weren't, you weren't though, because you were out dicking around at the store. And then before that yeah. at your office until 11 o'clock, you've learned nothing like this. This is the ultimate like show. Don't tell like, yeah. Okay. You get it that you have to be around, but like, like, I don't, I don't fucking know. Like tomorrow you're going to be like, Hey baby, I was going to get home at a reasonable hour. But then I just didn't. But you know what? I learned a valuable yep. lesson. It's like, what are you talking about? Like, this is not, this is <laughs> nothing. You're giving yourself a lot of brownie points for something yeah. that you haven't really done yet. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's like if I was like, I'm really mad at you um, because you never prepare enough for this podcast and you like don't do research and like you don't have like stuff ready when you come to the podcast and then I feel attacked <laughs> you came on the podcast and we're like hey I have done zero research and I haven't read the book but I just want you to know that I'm going to I would be fucking pissed like that would be a lot I'm gonna read it as we're doing the podcast actually <laughs> 
Ugh. <laughs> um, the most infuriating thing for me about this whole scene, though, is like, so they're having a discussion, and I guess Kate like tentatively decides they should work on their marriage, and she asks him why he has a change of heart, and then Robert says. It's a long story. It's not. It it's can not. literally be be told to me in the space of the time it would take to, I don't know, play a song on the radio. Less time, in fact, because that yeah, chorus like, repeats just, several just times. Just turn on your boombox. I'm sure it's on every station. <laughs> uh. Anyway, Maggie dies. It's super sad. Nathan doesn't really seem to be, I mean, he seems to be coping with it, but in that kind of, like, he's definitely in shock Mm -hmm. kind of way, and, like, everything, he's just, like, numb and just watching, like, the little details that don't even really matter, and it's all very sad. Uh, But it doesn't matter, because you know what? For some reason, Robert's mother dies on Christmas Day, too? (laughs) So. But not before giving him a, a special pipe that she wanted to give to her husband, before he died but he she was just saving it for a special moment and that moment never came and then he died i'm like okay but he didn't like die in like the titanic it wasn't like he left and you never saw him again like he was because she describes it like he was on his deathbed dying for a while and this exact same thing happens with maggie Uh where like she's on her deathbed and everyone brings her shit which really kind of undercuts the whole like christmas isn't about materialism thing when Everybody's like, here, Maggie, I got you the shawl you always wanted. Here, Maggie, I got you these special shoes. Here, Maggie, I got you some jewelry. Like, everyone's giving her shit, and that's, like, supposed to be good. But, like, caring about shit in general is not good. I don't know. But, yeah, it's not, like... Well, and can we talk about how morbid it is? Is like, these people actually, like, got her things to wear in her coffin? Yeah, that's... I mean, I don't know. Maybe... Merry Christmas, I guess. Maybe that's, like... Here's the things we're going to bury you Something that people who are, like, way more comfortable with death than I am would be like, yeah, that seems fine. Like, but no, I'm not okay with it. Maybe, yeah. But, yeah, like, so the, the grandma, like, gives him this pipe, and it's like, I never got the chance to give this to your father. It's like, but you did, though. Because he was, like, dying, and you could have just handed it to him. And that could have been a thing. But yeah. But you just, like, what? Yeah. And then, like, that kind of becomes the thing that, like, convinces him also that, like, you could have taken out the whole Christmas shoes part of this book and just had it been the pipe mm-hmm, thing. Mm-hmm. And that would have been fine. It would still have been a dumb book, but it, like, yes. would have made narrative sense. So that served no purpose because it was doing the exact same that the, the fucking shoes. I just... I didn't understand. It was dumb. And she includes a note with it, too, that's essentially just, like, hashtag yellow. Like, <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> no regrets. <laughs> uh, it's, it was dumb. She has a brain aneurysm, and she dies. Which also gets into, like, the, the whole um, thing with that also bothered me. Not only is this, like we kind of already said, kind of making it seem like the reason that Maggie got cancer was to teach Robert about Christmas, which is like, that's terrible. Mm -hmm. But also this is kind of all of the women in this book are kind of just there as object lessons (laughs) to the men. Like, yes. Like, I don't want to get too far into it, but it's real gross. And it made me real uncomfortable, especially considering it was written by a woman. Like, I don't know what was going on. And especially was, considering yeah, the original that was story, strange. the protagonist was a woman and the little kid was a little girl. I'm like, why the, why, why? Why'd you have to stray so far from the source material? Which was obviously a very real story and really happened. A hundred percent. hundred percent. Everyone in the mall stood up and clapped. <laughs> Robert's mother dies. And then there is the super abrupt flash forward that like, all the other jumps have had headings to tell us what year it is and, like, when mm-hmm. we are in this weird frame of a story. Except this one. We get a super abrupt flash forward that's between 1985 and the year 2000, as unspecified. Robert is now a grandfather. Oh, oh, oh. The baby's middle name is Robert. But, although we don't get a date for this, we do get... Because in the headings, there's always a quote mm-hmm. from someone... So there's, like, C.S. Lewis Mm -hmm. and Kierkegaard and stuff like that. And then in this chapter, fucking Donna Van Leer, like a fucking baller. I I will – I have to give her props for this because this is an insane, insane baller move. She fucking quotes herself. No, I didn't (laughs) notice that. Go to chapter eight, man. Go to chapter eight. 
Oh my god. Hold on, let me pull up the table of cards. Chapter 8. <gasps> yes! She did! She absolutely did! Death's power is limited. It cannot eradicate memories or slay love. It cannot destroy even a threadbare, threadbare faith or permanently hobble the smallest hope in God. It cannot permeate the soul, and it cannot cripple the spirit. It merely separates us for a while. That is the only power death can claim. Which, A... Oh. I don't know what Me. this is. Like, I don't know if this is a poem or what, because it's like formatted like a poem, but it's clearly not a poem. So that's weird. But also, yeah. like, it sounds like something out of like D&D, right? Like, it's like, except for the, yeah. the God part, it's like very like, that is the only power death can claim. Like, I don't know. It, it's just a very weird inclusion. And yes, and it didn't really fit. Well, I don't know. And it's also, it just, also... Makes me believe that Donna Van Leer, however you say her name, believes that her writing is as important as C.S. Lewis and Kierkegaard. <laughs> like, which I'm sorry, I'm going to go I ahead. I mean, you know, just all Spoiler the alert, it's not. Like, I'm not a huge fan of either of those writers, but it's just, it's just not. Like, I'm sorry. I don't mean to put, it's just not the same level. I'm very sorry that I have to tell you this, but... It's not. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. It's a mess. <laughs> <laughs> that just cracks me up. I can't focus on anything else. Now. She, like, why she couldn't was... she have just like put those thoughts into the story? Why did she think it was worthy of taking this free form poem and <laughs> slapping it at the head of the chapter? I just dropped my pen. Sorry. So anyway. Um, so yeah, they're a blunt, abrupt flash forward. Robert's grandfather. The baby's middle name is Robert. It's baby's first Christmas. There was no point to this because that is literally all the last chapter was. I guess we're supposed to get from that. Like, oh, he did change. Look at that. Honestly, though, this doesn't prove anything because the interaction that happens in this section, it's not even like it's just like, oh, OK. He was at a Christmas and his daughter named her kid after him. It's like, okay, but that doesn't, like, you could still be a shithead and attend a Christmas. <laughs> you could still be a shithead and your daughter's like, man, my dad is really distant and, like, I can never do anything to gain his approval. Um, I'm going to, like, try to r deal with these father issues by, like, immortalizing his name in my child's name because I have a lot of issues. Like, this doesn't prove anything. This doesn't show anything. It's just like, oh, okay, he made it to a Christmas. Like, okay, good. Like, cool. Who cares? It's so stupid. Awesome. So proud. So proud. <laughs> I'm so glad this really rich and awesome, decent man turned his life around. Right. So happy. Like, he was a garbage person the whole time, and now... The only evidence we have that he's not garbage is that he doesn't completely ignore his family. And it's like, that is the smallest. The bar is so fucking low. The bar is so low. Like, he probably still abuses yes, uh, yes. workers at auto mechanics. Like, he's probably still mean to them. He's, you know, like, he's yep. he probably still makes fun of his uh, secretary all the time. Like, he probably still isn't giving her enough vacation, yeah. clearly, because she has a breakdown every yeah. year. And he did his one good life deed. What so he's more could you ask? Good. Him? That's the rule. Yes. <sighs> Nothing else matters. Um. So that's the last chapter of the book. But we get an epilogue. Yay. Um. Where Robert? We come back to Robert at the cemetery in the year two thousand, and I guess it's a big reveal that he's visiting his mother's grave, which like I don't know, no one cares because it's fifteen years later. So I mean. I guess it wouldn't be super unheard of for his mother to have passed. Like, they could have told that in the in the first part of the book right. and it wouldn't have been super unusual. I don't know. Like, what was the why was this hidden from us in the first part of the, of the prologue? Like, it wasn't Ugh. anything special. But that's the big reveal. He's visiting his mother's grave. And he meets someone there, I guess we're supposed to assume, is Nathan because it's a young kid studying oncology at college. And then when we he goes to the gravestone, it's this, it's Maggie's name. And somehow Robert is able to put to an, oh, because he leaves the he leaves sparkle shoes on his mother's gravestone, mm -hmm. and so Robert's like, "Oh, there's that's that kid." And I, I think that, he also I bought shoes for. Sees that the date is the same. The death date is like the Christmas that this mm. happened. So he's like, "Ah, um, yes, yes." But also, real quick, can we talk about this one line that really confused me? And now I'm 
doubting my whole like life I guess because I, f- I feel okay. yeah so in this bit he says I know that most people decorated grave sites on Memorial Day do they is that a thing yeah is it I yeah. thought it was only soldiers <laughs> well I always thought I thought it was for yeah I thought it was for like veterans but um that is I guess like if people are to go on a holiday to decorate graves it would be memorial day would be a big one because there have been a lot of people i'm sure that have served in our country's military right 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 right, right. combat or whatever he says he says but my mother loved christmas not memorial day so it's like why would you go on memorial day for your mom's grave she wasn't in the army like she wasn't which i mean i don't i like, I was like, is Memorial Day, like, white people Day of the Dead and just no one told me? Or, like, what <laughs> is the... I didn't think it was. I thought it was strictly, like, military, right? Is yeah. That... Well, I feel like... Am I crazy? I feel like if it were... In, if I were in the shoes of someone going to visit someone's grave on a regular basis, mm-hmm. I would choose, like, maybe the day they died or their birthday yeah. or a day that was special yeah. to us. Like I wouldn't just like yeah. be like, Oh, it's the holiday. Got to do it. Which. Well, I again, would even, is I like, would even go with Christmas or whatever, but it's like, I would, yeah. cause I feel like Memorial day is specifically for military. So unless they were in the military, that's kind of like weird and a little, I don't want to say like rude, but it's kind of like rude. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit assuming. Yeah. I don't know. I just Googled um, Memorial Day grave decorating. I absolutely did that right now, too. There's a Pinterest board for Memorial Day grave decorating ideas, which that seems a little bit. I Googled Memorial Day traditions, and Uh none of them uh, say that you should do go to rant like your grandmother's grave and decorate it. Yeah. So I don't. I'm very confused as to what. Yeah, like, my family goes and decorates my grandfather's grave on Memorial Day. But, right. like, he served in World War II, so right that makes sense. Yeah. I don't know. I guess. I don't know. Okay, I'm looking at Wikipedia, and it says, Many people visit cemeteries and memorials particularly to honor those who have died in military service. So I guess the particularly means you could also do Usually. non-military. I, yeah, I guess maybe, like, memorial means to some people memorializing everyone. I don't know. That's another. Yeah, if you if you think that Memorial Day is a memorial for everyone, just like in, enlighten us. We're not like trying to shout out to or call out I'm to just, anybody. I'm like, literally just you're very awful confused. for doing it. Yeah, we just are not in the know on this. Oh, what was I gonna say? Oh, but also like, I guess that line like my mother preferred Christmas over Memorial Day. Well, like. Well, yeah, a lot of people do, don't they? Like, yeah, most people do. <laughs> Christmas is kind of like... And also, she died on Christmas Day? So I'm like, Right. I don't know if anyone who's like, man, you know which holiday I'm really looking forward to? Memorial Day. Like, mm-hmm. I don't think that's a sentence. I'm pretty sure that's a unique sentence that has never been spoken before in the history of the universe. I think that's the first time that sentence has been spoken aloud. <laughs> Um, oh, and then in case anyone was worried, uh, yes, there's also an afterword at the end to just, like, you know, even out all mm. of the layers. And it's, like, Tie two paragraphs. Of like, remember, guys, Christmas spirit. And that's the end of the book. Except it's not really even Christmas spirit. It's just God. It's, like, uh, yeah, believe in well, God. Because you should. Mm-hmm. It was a lot more than I expected. Unless you are, like, already very entrenched in this sort of belief this is gonna be weird to you and i'm not even saying like if you're religious versus atheist i'm saying like if you're not like to the point that you're like one of the people who goes up after tragedies and is like thoughts and prayers thoughts and prayers everything happens for a reason which is like a terrible thing to say after a tragedy like this book is gonna be off-putting because it's Mm. very much like everything happens for a reason and God has the plan. And I'm mm-hmm. like, that's cool. But, like, what you've shown me, again, is that the reason that this tragedy happened was so that a rich white man wouldn't break up with his wife. Like, yeah, that's a very poor reason. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, 
Yes, and the last 25% of the books are dedicated to the lyrics of the song Christmas Shoes and a preview of this woman's other book, uh, or sequel to this book, which it's a, it's a series called Christmas Hope, so I'm hoping it's just different Christmas stories and not, like, the follow-up to Robert's life or anything. But considering how big of a preview we got, it was probably, like, half of the length of the book of the next book. So mm-hmm. it, it was very long. Um, and I didn't read any of it. I did not either. I did not care at that mm. point. Although I will say I did find it interesting that um, one of the advertisements for the song in this, after it has the entire lyrics written in the book, mm-hmm. it also says, you've read the story, you've heard the song, now experience the album, The Christmas yeah. Shoes, available from New Song wherever you buy music. And I looked it up and I couldn't find an album called The Christmas Shoes. Oh. Huh. I was very confused. So it was not available from New Song wherever I buy music, because where I buy music is the internet, and by yes. s- buy music, I mean stream. <laughs> I feel lied to. Um, I want a refund for more than one reason. <laughs> um, yeah, so moral of the story, you're going to be a bad person until shoes happen. <laughs> so Ding go out there into the shoes. world and find your shoes. What was your, uh, if you had one, was there a silver lining to this for um, I did actually have one. Oh, okay. Go for it. Um, mine was that at one point they're describing how Robert's mom throws a decorate the tree party or something like that. Oh. Um, yeah, like trim the tree. And Yeah, and my grandmother always threw a trim the tree party uh, around Christmas time, and that was kind of like our big christmas get together um so that just kind of made me think of that and remember fun holiday times as a child and Mm. like that was nice but like all of the rest of the book kind of aggressively sucked away any fun christmasy feelings i had so that kind of ruined it but the one mention of a thing that i kind of celebrate was nice (laughs) how about you yeah yeah uh mine was that the book was a lot shorter than i thought it would be because i'm getting to chapter eight and it's all like there's like 68 percent of the book left and i'm like we're talking about robert's grandchildren now how much more of this am i gonna have to read about this man's life but no it's just a few pages it <laughs> so was, that was a nice christmas surprise it's very very sh- blessedly short <laughs> um who did you most relate to in this book uh well all of the characters are definitely just like totally flat charcuterie mm-hmm. boards of characters yeah um so i think i think i will i would have to say maggie just because i feel like i'm also like aggressively a people pleaser and even if i was dying of cancer i'd just be like everyone else's happiness comes before mine and please i'm sorry i'm dying please don't let's just joke about it <laughs> that would probably be me no i'm just picturing that scene where she gets all the presents as like her just being like you know how sometimes at Christmas you get stuff that you don't like and you're like, oh, thanks. Like, that that was her reaction to everything. That, like, they're like, oh, I got you this <laughs> shawl. And she's like, oh, great. Thank you so oh, much. Does it come with a grift receipt? <laughs> do, you, do you think you could uh, let me know what store you got that from? I like it so much. I might want to get something else there. So much. So much. And you know those <laughs> shoes were ugly. You know those shoes were ugly. Oh, yeah. They were... they were, like, described as, like, blue and green and red sparkle shoes. Jewels. And, but they like, didn't tell, like, bejeweled. what style of shoes. I was picturing, so, like... I was thinking, like, mules. Oh, I was picturing, like, a straight-up pump with just, like, fake, um, like, rubies and sapphires and emeralds on oh. the toes. Because they're also the most yes. expensive ones there. But they sounded hideous. Like, in that way that expensive things are hideous. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I was imagining like you know those shoes that were like the slip-ons that didn't have a back. Mm-hmm. Those are called mules, right? Yeah. Um, that were really popular, like maybe when we were in junior high or like late elementary school. That were like the dazzled with flowers on the front, but then the rest was like the rest of the shoe was just like see-through. Mm, mm. I'm nodding a lot. I'm nodding That's a what lot. I was imagining. Yeah, those would be good too. <laughs> I don't think I'm doing a good job of describing them, but they were kind of like all over the place. <laughs> we'll see if we can a find a picture for like two to, weeks, maybe to post of Anna's theoretical Christmas shoes. Yeah, <laughs> I will type that exact phrasing into Google and see what pops up. <laughs> um, how about you? Did you say what character you really? Uh, I didn't, I did. but 
It I is the, I read this passage and I was like, yes, this is me on a spiritual level. Um, the incomplete snowman in Nathan's driveway. <laughs> <laughs> With a Coke bottle for a nose. <laughs> yes. Not a major character. Only appears in one sentence, which goes as follows. The beginnings of a snowman stood in the yard, but whoever started it had quit, leaving a single large ball with stick arms and pine cone eyes and a soda bottle for a nose. And that, you can you can tell. I mean, like, you guys, you listeners at home might not know, but Anna, you're, like, looking at me. That is exactly what I look like. A hundred percent. We've often joked about that behind mm-hmm, your back. Just, like, <laughs> a giant ball <laughs> with little stick arms. <laughs> And really spiky Which, eyeballs. To me, it's confusing because he says, like, the snowman wasn't finished, but clearly it was because someone it put was. the accessories on the snowman right. already. I think like, that's, a, that's a complete snowman. Bad at snowmen. <laughs> it's just a very short and squat one. It's just a snowman. We're tall. I think we're never really told how big the ball is. Well, I think it, it doesn't matter how big it is. Uh, I mean, we do say single large ball, so it's large, but we don't have anything to compare with Mm. but i think the bigger issue than the size of it is just that there is only one of them so like even though he didn't complete it he was like this is the head now and just but also the body (laughs) because it has arms so it's just like a torso (laughs) with a face on it like krang from teenage mutant ninja turtles (laughs) was that going on in the 80s maybe that's what he was talking about yeah when was teenage mutant ninja turtles happening in the 80s yeah, so I think that's really what it was. It wasn't a snowman. It was a snow crang. And he was going to wear it around his waist. It's fine. <laughs> oh, man. All right. What's the rather be reading? Oh, fuck. Okay. Um, so I had a hard time with this because I think we kind of discussed last time. I don't really read Christmas books because I feel like mm-hmm. that is a thing that is primarily done by a subset of the population that is not me um it'll be our third podcast <laughs> <I know>. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no but I, so i decided to go with another cancer book um so the excellent <laughs> the book that i would rather be reading this week is um the fault in our stars by john green which i really like the book the book's uh pretty good and it deals with a um girl who is dying of cancer and she Mm -hmm. meets a boy who also has cancer and they uh fall for each other and also go on adventures together and it is very sad and um also very uplifting um and kind of deals with like questions of the afterlife and stuff in a way that's not quite as cheesy as this um and also is from the perspective of the person who is dealing with the disease and also john green spent time as like a chaplain working or like uh he was like learning to be a chaplain and he worked at a children's hospital for a while so like Hmm. i didn't know that uh yeah like a little bit a little bit less cancer porny (laughs) Yeah, if you want to read a book about cancer because you hate yourself for some reason and want to read about sad shit, like, that one is a lot better than this one. (laughs) Uh, um, I kind of also went in, like, a similar direction of something sad. went in a cancer direction? Sad. Well, I did not go in a cancer direction. I went in the dead spouse direction. Mm, Good, good. Um, Another good subject. (laughs) I was reminded of this book because we were talking about it relatively recently. uh, The Storied Life of A.J. Fickery Fickery, by Gabrielle Zevin, Mm. which is a book about a man whose um, wife dies and he kind of goes into like a depressed slump and is... um, obviously because he's traumatized by the fact that he lost his spouse early on in life and um then he is surprised with a baby that he decides to adopt and then his life gets better but it's like the story it's like it's much more than i'm not describing it very well but anyway i i I enjoyed that i thought it was a cute story and um much more uplifting and not as sad and just 
slamming you in the face with yeah sadness and i think we kind of talked about this this last week a little bit like i'm not opposed to sad stories but i don't like this where it's a sad story that's like trying to be uplifting so hard it's just like it's trying too hard you know yeah and it just really it feels manipulative yes it feels it feels manipulative so that wraps it up for this fortnight so next fortnight um we are going to be doing another rewind episode to uh, a book that Anna hated in her college years, which hopefully will be just as easy a read as my rewind episode on Terry Pratchett's Hogfather. Um, so what do, you, what do you have for us, Anna? <laughs> well, okay. So we read, uh, my senior year of high school, we read Pride and Prejudice. Mm-hmm. And so like any young, impressionable girl of a certain age, I was drawn into this idea of um what is it it regency romances Mm -hmm. is that the right okay um and you know you would think the next logical step would be like oh let's read some other things like sense and sensibility or emma but no the direction i went in um after high school and into college was let's read basically uh sequels to pride and prejudice that were written in modern day like no i think that's a pretty common (laughs) common uh, response to pride and prejudice thus why there are so many sequels and i also uh was super big into paranormal romance as you could probably have guessed by listening to several of our um previous episodes and so the two of these interests clashed in a very awful way and i found at my local library one day the book Mr. Darcy Vampire by Amanda Grange. Oh, no. <laughs> so, I thought we were going to go with the Pride and Prejudice and Zombies, which isn't necessarily oh, no. bad. It just gets kind of like, okay, I get the joke after a while. But we veered, didn't we? Yeah. <laughs> you zigged when I thought you would zag. <laughs> so I don't remember a lot about this book because I did read it about 10 years ago. Mm-hmm. Uh, I just know that I it was not what I was looking for at all. Um, so I will go ahead and I guess read the very short synopsis of it on um, <laughs> Goodreads, which as any good book synopsis is, is written in the first person. <laughs> a married man in possession of a dark fortune must be in want of an eternal wife. My hand is trembling as I write this letter. My nerves are in tatters, and I am so altered that I believe you would not recognize me. The past two months have been a nightmarish whirl of strange and disturbing circumstances. And the future? I am afraid. If anything happens to me, remember that I love you, and that my spirit will always be with you, that we may never see each other again. The world is a cold and frightening place where nothing is as it seems. So, I'm so that told to me absolutely that. nothing about this book. <laughs> I think the title of though the fair, title of it tells fair, you pretty just much everything you need to know. Mr. Darcy's a vampire, spelled with a Y and not an I. Oh no! <laughs> <laughs> oh, please tell me that there's so, dark magic spelled with a K in this one. Uh, not in the, not in the uh, synopsis, and I don't know if there is in the actual book because I haven't opened this. It, it, this came from a, a period of time where I was much m- even less discerning than I am now, and liked pretty much everything I read. And I gave yep. this a two stars in uh, two thousand and nine, so wow. it had to have really been bad for me to do that. Wow. <laughs> okay, so uh, come on back next fortnight for our coverage on that. <laughs> I'm so excited. Um, As a reminder to everyone, we are going to be launching our new podcast tomorrow from the time that this airs. Um, So Mm -hmm. if you guys would like to check that out, it is a podcast in which we discuss Christmas rom-coms. So think, you know... Uh, the Christmas Prince, Love Actually, stuff like that. Uh, the first one we're covering is The Princess Switch, which is one of the Netflix originals Schmish, this year. Schmish. The Christmas Switch, which is one of the Netflix originals this year. And it's a pretty fun episode. So if you guys want to check that out, uh, the easiest way to find it right now is going to be 12 months or following the 
uh, account on Twitter for that, which is at 12 months podcast. Um, but it should also be on the various podcast aggregates mm-hmm. shortly, uh, hopefully quickly. Um, but we'll yes. see. And that's number one, number two, not spelled out 12 on Twitter. If you want to follow this current podcast, you can find us on Twitter at hate readcast. And you can also email us, uh, hate at gmail.com. Uh, as always, thank you to Ben Cope for our theme song. You can check out his YouTube channel in the show notes down below. And if you are not yet following this podcast on whatever podcast app you use to follow podcasts, you should follow us, please. And if that is iTunes that you use, then it would be awesome if you left us a five-star review. In the words of Donna Van Lier, we all have questions in this life. It's taken me a long time to figure out what the really important questions are, the ones that matter. Not, how am I going to make enough money? Or, what can I do to get promoted? No. More like, what are the flowers thinking beneath the snow? (laughs) They did. (laughs) And then, to be clear, the as an aside thing, that I, I will think. delete, I'm not actually mm-hmm. mad at you about not doing research. That's just a funny bit because I keep complaining <laughs> about you not being prepared I for the podcast. You <laughs> just, just wanted to be clear. <laughs>